Good morning, and welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Christian Markward, and sorry, I'm one minute late. I was having a bad robe day. This is so many, like, you don't know it, but this has all these little Velcro straps in different places, and if I don't have them all right, then this thing is all off kilter. So we got it figured out, but... After our last series, we're actually starting a new one, a new three-week series talking about how God has flipped our expectations. And it sounds so cutesy, I really don't like it, but I thought of it and it was the first thing, so that's what we're going with. Talking about how God has flipped our expectations this week about how God takes people who are far away from them, far away from him, and brings them near. Um, Just another example of God's grace and mercy to us. We're going to get started this morning with our opening hymn. That's hymn number 621. You'll find that near the back of the blue hymnal. The words are also displayed on the screen. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen. Our worship continues as we use the service setting three, which is found on page 188 in the front of the blue hymnal. The words are also on the screen. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins, 
and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
O God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace, that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 66. Because this also serves as our sermon text, I won't get too into depth right now, but just hearing these words from God, as he describes people that are very far away from Jerusalem, people that are far away from the promised land, hearing that they might get to hear about the Messiah, about a Savior who was sent even for them, hearing that that was going to happen, I'm sure would have been a shock to the Jewish people at the time, But to us, having seen the fulfillment of that promise, knowing that the gospel has gone out to all nations and all languages, is very comforting. A reading from Isaiah 66, beginning at verse 18. And I, because of their actions and their imaginations, am about to come and gather all nations and tongues, and they will come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and I will send some of those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians, famous as archers, to Tubal and Greece, and to the distant islands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory among the nations. And they will bring all your brothers from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord, on horses, in chariots and wagons, and on mules and camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings, to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. And I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. And they will go out and look upon the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. Their worm will not die, nor will their fire be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. The word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Here the writer to the Hebrews, which uh, does not seem to be the Apostle Paul, although for many generations Christians simply assume that. The writer to the Hebrews says that we have come to something different and better than what they had in the Old Testament. We're not coming to Mount Sinai to be terrified of God, afraid that we might sin against him and be destroyed, but we're coming to a place where God has welcomed all people, all nations, all languages, all to hear that the gospel of Jesus is for them as well. That means the gospel of Jesus is for you as well. A reading from Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The word of the Lord. Our worship continues as we join in singing the gospel acclamation together. If you're following along in the hymnal, please note that we will sing the gospel acclamation for God's love. Please stand. Alleluia, alleluia. Read. 
rejoice in the Lord for his love and faithfulness. Alleluia, alleluia. The Gospel reading for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost is from Luke chapter 13. The reading begins at verse 22. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will, he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We continue by singing our hymn of the day. That's hymn number 698. You'll also find that near the back of the blue hymnal. The words are also displayed on the screen.
and I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. This is a new series where you have another three weeks talking about how God has flipped things, how God has changed our expectations. And so if that is what we're going to talk about, we have to start out by establishing what our expectations are. It's a common thing to think that this is God's house. Therefore, when I'm close to this house, when I'm inside of this house, I'm close to God. I'm not sure where God is exactly in this space, if he's there or there. Perhaps he's closest to the front, so if you sit in the front, you're a better Christian than those who sit in the back. I don't know if that's true. But this is a building, and a church is not a building. A church is really a gathering of believers, and God says, wherever my believers are, there I am with them. And that means that God isn't just close to us on Sunday morning. That means God could be close to us throughout the entire week. God could be close to a mother and her children as she's driving in a minivan. God could be close to a husband and wife as they're sitting in a park somewhere in the city. God could be close to someone, one of you and your coworker, as you're talking about God and his word. All of those could be considered the church because God is there among his believers. And so that means God's here. God is with us, not just in this building, although this is a very nice looking building. And so it would be natural to assume God must be closer to us here. But we want to be careful to think that because we showed up to church on a Sunday that we're close to God. In fact, really the opposite could be true. We could be looking at this as some, a box that we check off. I made it here on Sunday. I accomplished it. I know God wants me to be in church once a week. That's not actually in the Bible. But I know that God wants me to do that. And so I did it. And so I'm close to God. And yet, even though uh, in the communicator for next month, I have an article about the lectionary and how the lectionary is something that's good and useful. It's a series of readings that addresses different topics throughout the year. I'm going to add something. I'm just going to read a few verses from the beginning of Isaiah 66. And I know some of you like to follow along in your Bible, and if you'd like to do that, it's in Isaiah 66. And if you don't want to, that's okay. I'll try to read clearly enough so that you can hear me without seeing the words. This is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. But whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a man. And whoever offers a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is like one who presents pig's blood. And whoever burns memorial incense like one who worships an idol. They have chosen their own ways and their souls delight in their abominations. So I also will choose harsh treatment for them. What the prophet Isaiah is saying at the very end of his book is that there were people who were doing what seemed to be good. God commanded sacrifices in the Old Testament. So they were bringing sacrifices, but God said, I'm not just concerned about what you're bringing me. I don't primarily value the offering. I'm not primarily concerned with how much money you put in the plate. I'm not primarily concerned with how pure the sacrifice is or how large the animal is that you're bringing to me. I'm concerned with your heart. And if that's the case, then God says, this is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. In a sense, that's even harder than showing up to church once a week on a Sunday saying, God, I'm going to give you my one hour and then I'm out. I'm going to bring you my sacrifice. You commanded a sacrifice in the Old Testament, sacrificial system. God commanded sacrifices. But God said, I'm primarily concerned with what's in your heart. It's possible that you could bring me a sacrifice, but not really mean it or care about it, but just be doing it to do it. And that means that you and I need to be humble and we need to repent. And we need to apologize to people when we've harmed them just this week. And I know that... You like to think of me as a very sanctified and pure person. I like to think that too. But I had to apologize to two different pastors when I hadn't been careful enough with my words. That my words had caused a division between us. 
And I felt convicted because I preached about it on Sunday. And I said, don't be causing division for no reason. I said, I've got to do that myself. And I apologized. Not that I'm the hero of this story. The truth is, all of us need to repent at times, to apologize, to be contrite and say, I'm going to submit to God's word, even if it says something challenging to me. And God wants my heart. The actions will follow, but the actions can't precede the heart. That's no good. That doesn't do anything. And so really what Isaiah is telling the Old Testament people is, the people who lived in Jerusalem, you can feel like you're very close to God and yet not be close to God at all. You can have been faithful, the way you understand it, in showing up, in giving, but your heart wasn't in it. And now, as we get to the end of this chapter, God says, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do something completely different from what I've been doing through all of human history. I know it's hard for us, knowing how the gospel spread in the New Testament, to go back and read the Old Testament. I understand that. Because it's hard to think, well, why didn't everyone just hear about the gospel all the time? Why weren't there missionaries in every country? God did what he did. But God says, now I'm going to do something different. And I can imagine... I can imagine how confusing and even offensive these words would be to people who grew up in, with, under the Old Testament system, with the law of Moses, knowing the way that things were done, God saying, I'm going to do it differently. But when you and I hear these words, we say, yes, that means that God's promises are for me too. That means that, you know, you and I, were, we should be far from God. If God is geographically in one location, you and I would be very far from him. Because if God was in, a, a, was in one location, was in one building, it would not be this building. It would be a temple in Jerusalem. And yet, the gospel started in a postage stamp size on a globe, and it spread, now it's here. If God was just in lo one location, you and I would not have heard who Jesus was, what he did for us, and yet we have. Because God has said, I'm going to go to people who are even far away from me. I'm going to bring them and make them close. So, in these verses, God says, speaking to the prophet Isaiah, I'm going to set a sign among them. And that's what God says a lot of the time when something really special is about to happen. I'm going to send a sign to them, and some of those who survive... Because if you continue to read through Isaiah 66, pretty much all commentators agree when he's talking about destruction and devastation, he's really talking about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. Saying this really bad thing is going to happen. But from those who survive, I will send some of those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish. That's the place that Jonah was trying to run away to. He said, if I ran across the world, if I went across, and it seems as far as we can tell that Tarshish was probably somewhere in Spain. Jonah's saying, if I go a far away, God won't be there. And I'm sure a lot of Jewish people thought that. God's not in Spain. God's not in Tarshish. Well, God's going to send his missionaries there. They're going to go to Tarshish. They're going to go to the Libyans and Lydians. And as far as we can tell, that seems to be regions in northern Africa. We're going to send them to Tubal, which is Asia Minor. We're going to send them to Greece. They're going to go around there and to the islands that have not heard of my fame or see my glory, and my people are going to proclaim my glory among the nations. And if you look at a map of the nations from the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, we hear about all these different nations, people from, people from northern Africa, people from Greece. People had come in because they were there to celebrate a festival. And they didn't just get to celebrate a festival. They got to hear Peter preaching about Jesus. And they got to go and take that message to their neighbors and their families and their friends. And the gospel started to spread from that day to these very nations that were written about in Isaiah 66 all those years ago. Now, of course, it's here in North America, it's in South America, it's all throughout the world because the gospel has gone out to all of them and they've gotten to hear about the glory 
of God and what he's done for them. And that first message has gone out too. With God saying, you need to be humble. You need to be contrite. You need to submit yourselves to God's law. And at the same time, you get to hear about a savior. You get to hear about Jesus Christ, who lived and died for you. By rights, you and I should be very far away from God. And maybe you feel like that sometimes, that God's not here, or God's not where you are. And he must be somewhere, but where is he? And God says, no, wherever my people gather together, there I am with them. God has taken you from far away, and he's brought you close to him. He didn't have to move you on a boat. He didn't have to fly you on a plane. Really, he closed the distance. And he came to be here, and he is here with you. And he is here with us this morning. And he is here with us this afternoon, wherever we happen to go. But that's not all. That sounds good enough. That sounds good to know that wherever I go, God is there with me. When I sin, the Lord forgives me. And to know that God knits his people together in all sorts of ways. But God says, that's not enough. I'm going to have a lot of people coming in now. The church, which again is not a building, it's a community of believers. The church is going to grow. We're going to need some new people. And God says, that's what I'm going to do. And so all these people, they're going to bring them to my holy mountain in Jerusalem on horses and chariots and wagons and mules and camels. Like the way the people bring grain offerings, that's how we're going to bring people. This is the new offering now. It's people now. Forget about grain. Forget about sacrifices. We're doing something different. I'm going to select some of them to be priests and Levites. What are you talking about, God? You have never done that. A non-Jewish person would never be a priest. You'd never even be a Levite. You wouldn't be the person sacrificing the animals, telling people that the Lord has taken your sins away. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't be somebody who helps out in the temple, cleans things up, lights the candles, that sort of thing. You wouldn't get to be a Levite. And yet God says, no, I'm going to do that now. The old priestly system, that's going to go away. And I don't have any better way to really explain how meaningful than, that is than, than what a non-Christian man told me. Um, about a year ago, when my wife and I were in Belize, and we were going on a tour, there was a tour guide, and he was telling us about the religious practices of the Mayan people, and the way that things worked in their societies. And he was just asking people, what's your job? What do you do? I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he said, oh, uh-oh, I better... I don't want to offend this guy with his different religious beliefs. I said, don't worry about it. It's your tour. It's not mine. But he said, he asked me, is your father a pastor or a priest? And your grandfather before him? I said, no. He said, see, if you were living in that society, being a priest, it was passed down from father to son to grandson to great-grandson. It just kept on going like that. You were in one class or another. You were in the ruling class or you were just a regular worker. You were a priest or you weren't. I said, yeah, that is kind of cool. Because it's the same way with the Jewish people. You were a priest or you weren't. You were a Levite or you weren't. You couldn't choose it. It wasn't a job. There was no job fair where you signed up and you say, I like to be an apprentice. You either were or you weren't. A Levite was a family, the family of Levi. So either you were part of that family or you weren't. Do you want to be involved in ministry? Well, you either are or you aren't. By birth, you don't get to choose it. Now, God does things differently. And he gives people opportunity to serve. And he gives people opportunities to minister to one another in new ways that he hadn't before. And if you're a non-Jewish person, which I would assume is just about all of you, God has brought you in and made you a part of his family and taken this ministry that has touched your heart and given you a role in sharing that message with others. I know it's hard for us to think because we think Christianity has always existed in this geographic location, but it hasn't. And now God has taken us from far away and made us near. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and your descendants. Is it going to happen 
through the natural people? Are they going to continue having descendants forever? God says, no, I'm new people. I'm creating new people. I'm bringing them in. They're going to be part of my people. They're going to be priests. They're going to be Levites. They're going to share the message together, and they're going to be united. So as we walk away from this, let's remember a few important things. You can be in here on a Sunday, every Sunday, and yet actually be far away from God. You can be here and hear God's word, which convicts your heart and reject it. And you, at the same time, could feel like you're very far away from God. Like he's not there. Like he doesn't hear your prayers. Like he doesn't care about you. Like he's abandoned you. Like he's thrown you to the wolves and he's not going to back you up. But God is close to his people. And God desires that his people be humble and contrite and repent. And God has taken us, most of whom are unrelated, and made us part of one family. And when we gather together, God is here with us. And when you go, God is there with you. God has taken you who were far and made you very near to him. He's flipped in. Amen. Our worship continues as we join in a confession of faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, which have been used by the Christian church for hundreds of years. Please stand as we confess our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our prayer of the church. Loving God and Lord, you created a universe that surrounds us in the globe on which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Give your word power as it works in hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your Spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Give us courage to carry the cross with patience and joy. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. We offer special prayers on behalf of our members who are homebound. For Jackie Bequest and Jerry Begalke, 
for Carol Brandt and Carol Kianka, for Joyce Martin, Shirley Schultz, James and Antonia Tomasek, and for Don Wiege. Lord, please be with all of these faithful believers of yours, strengthen them with your word, and give us opportunities to comfort them as well. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, Prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Hear us, Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law. That he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. 
Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will strengthen and preserve you. The one true faith to life everlasting. All of your sins are forgiven. You may live in peace. Amen. Amen. We stand for thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Uh, this hymn will be familiar to some of you, may not be to all of you, so uh, Nick Stoltz is going to help sing it. You're welcome to sing it right along with him.
The hymnal said that that song came out in 2011, but I don't know. I've heard that a lot in different places. I'm sure it's the same for some of you. Once again, good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Christian Marquardt. Very glad that you had the opportunity to worship with us here today. I do have several announcements, um, things that are going on. The first thing um, is on the very back of your bulletin, there's a thank you from Shining Star. This is a picture of all the donations that people gave. Um, it was very generous. Um, it surprised me. It surprised them, and they're very thankful for that. I actually have a card for St. James Lutheran Church. We also had um, a presence at their open house, which was this past Monday night. So another big thank you to everyone who was there and helped out. Um, the Shavers set up games for the kids. We had members who were handing out um, snacks and we had water there and it was just really nice. And I know that even if <laughs> the parents don't exactly know what St. James is, it made a big impression on the staff. And so that's why they gave us this card. It says, we are looking forward to a great year as partners with St. James Lutheran Church. Thank you for your generosity from Shining Star staff. So once again, big thank you to all of you. You, you made us look really good. And it's a positive step in that, in that way. I was going to ask for volunteers to spread mulch, but somebody already dumped out the mulch. I don't know who did that. Um, there's some mulch in the parking lot. That's all. We're very near the end of our time to purchase a hymnal. So if you would like to buy one of these hymnals for your own personal use, we have a sign-up sheet. We're going to put in the order very soon. If you'd like to buy a hymnal, please sign up um, on the bulletin board and just say, how many would you like? Would you like to donate one to a shut-in? I think there's already a lot of people who have offered to buy one for a shut-in. Um, but if there's anyone who'd like to purchase a hymnal for your own use, uh, please do that before, uh, I think the 31st is our deadline on that. In a couple weeks, there is an announcement in the bulletin, but we're hoping to have what I'm going to call for now Small Group Sunday, just to get all the small group leaders together in one closely confined space <laughs> and just put information out there about all the different things going on at St. James. I know a choir is starting up around that time, handbells is starting up around that time, community group is starting up around that time, and there's other groups that are happening here at St. James. And it's possible that some of you are not involved in a group, or it's possible that some of you are looking for a group and don't feel all that connected. So um, that'll be September 11th following the service, just an opportunity to get some of that out there. Um, two more things. I'm sorry, it's a lot. Following the service today at about 10.45 or so, we will have a Bible study time here in the sanctuary. We are going through, I prepared a little handout for helping you to prepare for your funeral. So you can, some readings that you can look at some hymns. Um, I also have a comparison from the new hymnal to the old hymnal, because I bet even now when you think of a hymn, you think of a certain number. Well, now you can know what the new number is in the hymnal. So that'll be here in the sanctuary. Last thing, voters meeting is coming up next Sunday. Um, so just be aware that that's happening. 